It was like they always say, your life really does flash before your eyes. There it all was, stretching back to my childhood. Born into a family of master thieves that went back for generations, I was next in line to continue the Cooper name. But fate had different plans. I was robbed of my childhood when a ruthless gang attacked our home. The orphanage I landed in wasn't all bad. It was there that I met my lifelong friends. Bentley, he's always been the thinker. And Murray, he's the doer. We'd stuck together over the years, and our skill, our confidence, and our thieving reputation grew stronger with each heist. We thought that the good times would never end, and that our luck would never run out which only made things tougher when the odds finally caught up with us. Then I met this guy, McSweeney, who claimed to have run with my father's crew back in their heyday. They pulled jobs all over the world and amassed quite a collection of priceless items. It was then that McSweeney told me all about the Cooper Vault. It seemed that my father, like all my ancestors, had been hiding their wealth in a secret place for generations, each one adding to the treasure hidden behind a door that if McSweeney's story is true, only a Cooper can open. Using some well-placed clues provided by McSweeney, we set out for the secret island that held the vault. On arriving, we discovered someone by the name of Dr. M had already set up shop. From the looks of it, he'd been trying to crack the thing for years, growing steadily more frustrated in his failures and more paranoid as the decades rolled by. He built himself a fortress with security as tight as Fort Knox. Getting inside the place would take precision, creativity, and moreover, it would take an army of world-class thieves. Finding and bringing together that much talent won't be easy, but to get inside the Cooper vault and collect my inheritance, I was willing to pay the price. Getting inside a world-class vault would take a team of world-class thieves, a group of specialists, each member contributing their own particular talent. It was clear that we needed Murray back. Not only was I missing a lifelong friend, but his brute strength helped get us out of more than a few scrapes in the past. When Bentley was injured during the whole clockwork affair, Murray blamed himself, eventually leaving the team. We tried to console him, but going out on his own was something he needed to do. He said he wanted to find his spiritual center. We got word that Murray ended up in the Australian outback where he studied a mystic art called the dream time from an aboriginal guru. From all accounts, things went pretty well, and his teacher even sent him on a walkabout to locations all over the globe to complete the training. Latest reports have cited Murray in beautiful Venice, Italy, but what he's doing there is a mystery. I just hope he steers clear of the local mob boss, Octavio. Growing up, this guy used to be a real celebrity in the neighborhood. Everyone loved to hear him sing opera and said he was destined to be the next great tenor. But just as his career started to take off, musical tastes changed. Suddenly, it was all about rock music and no one wanted to listen to opera anymore. He held on to a few fans and it was these mobsters that took him into the business. Heading onto this guy's turf was dangerous, but worth it for a chance to make things right with Murray. Murray, 
refuses to join the gang until the commitment to his guru has been fulfilled. Whether we like it or not, we've got to deal with Venice's tar problems in order to, as Murray puts it, make the black water run pure. Thanks to Inspector Fox's fine detective work, we already know that Don Octavio is somehow connected. As non-law operatives, we'll be able to tackle the situation in a more head-on fashion. First, we break into Octavio's opera house. If he's hiding anything, we'll find him. We should also keep a close eye on the dog. Some photographic evidence of him connected to the tar might be enough to get the old mobster put away. Of course, meanwhile, I'll monitor local communication frequencies. With some luck, we might pick up some quality intel. According to these decrypted files, Octavio is pumping tar from underneath the foundations of buildings so he can sink them into the canals on a whim. He's going to demonstrate this destructive ability to the people of Venice during his opera recital on the first day of Carnival. To counter this threat, we'll first destroy the balloons inside, advertising the recital. If no one shows up, He'll have no reason to sink a building. Next, the blueprints to the main tar vacuum have been cleverly split into three parts and hidden in local coffee houses owned by Octavia. Unfortunately, they're under constant guard, so you'll need to use a disguise to get us inside. Also, some big Vincennetti goons have been called in as insurance for the recital. Given their size, I think it's prudent to fool Carmelita's eight mercenaries into taking them out for us. And finally, we'll have to convince Murray into taking to the field. If he's learned the aboriginal ball form, it'll be just the thing for destroying the local tar reservoirs. With Octavio's comeback opera recital just a few hours away, we're all set up for the main event. Get ready for Operation Tar Be Gone. Our objective, get Murray back on the team. Sly, you'll start things off by using your disguise to sneak into the opera house. Make your way down to the pump room and let me in through the side entrance. Thanks to the blueprints we stole, I now know just where to bomb to cripple the machinery. Then we'll go for Octavio's detonation switch. I'm sure you'd agree that we just can't leave a weapon that powerful in the hands of such a madman. So I'll distract the old monster with an opera duel. He's sure not to attack while we're both on stage. Meanwhile, the old cut the lines to the chandelier and drop it on his head. I'll swipe the switch and we'll both find Murray. By then, the black water is sure to be running clear and he'll be free to come with us. With the fight over, we went back and scraped Bentley off the pavement. It was touch and go for a while there, but we managed to sneak out right under Carmelita's nose. Octavio wasn't so lucky. The guy got 30 years behind bars for what he did to Venice. I guess Italians don't like it when you sink their landmarks. Ironically, he found success as a singer while in jail. After all, most of his old fan base was already in the clink. But the big score here was bringing our old pal back into the gang. Once he put on those gloves and that mask, it was clear to everyone, most of all him, that the Murray had returned.
At first, it seemed just like old times. The gang was back in action. But little by little, we learned that Murray's heart just wasn't in it. Without the guru's permission to give up on his dreamtime training, he'd never really feel comfortable returning to the gang. We knew we needed to help him out. So, we packed up our things, whipped up some quick disguises, and headed for the Australian Outback. Along the way, Murray told us story after story about his teacher's amazing abilities. Apparently, this guru of his was capable of fantastic feats. He used the dream time to blend perfectly into his surroundings, and even gain mental control over the weak-minded. If even half the stories were true, then this was a guy I just had to meet. Our gang needed to grow its ranks for a chance to get inside the Cooper vault. And this guru, this outback mystic, was looking like the best recruit we could have ever asked for. However, when we finally arrived in the outback, it was a shock to find that things had changed. And the guru was nowhere to be seen. The guru won't leave the stockade until he has his walking staff and his moonstone. He also insists that we purify Ayer's rock of all miners. Only then will the Dreamtime spirits be appeased and the guru will be free to use his powers. Sly must have impressed him in their conversation because now he is requesting that Murray and I meet with him individually. Something about judging our spiritual centers. I've discovered a passage through one of the miners' caves that should make getting up to the guru less difficult. He also mentioned that the miners had foolishly unearthed the mask of dark earth. <laughs> 
I guess it was his job to guard the thing, and now that it's out, bad things are sure to follow. Sounds like mumbo jumbo to me, but we've encountered some unexplainable phenomena over the years, so I'm not gonna rule it out as a threat to our operation. The Guru has agreed to join our team, provided we can rid his homeland of the Dingo Miners and deal with the Mask of Dark Earth. A tall order, but we're up for it. First, we'll enlist the aid of some local wildlife to help fit out the miners' ranks. Murray will feed our foes to a local giant crocodile. With some luck, he'll take a liking to the taste of miners and chow down on them left and right. Second, we'll hit these guys where they live, or at least relax. If we can clear them out of this lemonade bar, it'll be a crippling blow to their morale. They'll be begging to go home. And finally, Sly will use some mining equipment to drill for radioactive oil deep beneath the dried lake bank. Trust me, it's the key to getting rid of the Mask of Dark Earth. You can feel it in the air. The miners are about to pack it in. In fact, they'd probably already be long gone if it weren't for the corrupting influence of the Mask of Dark Earth. It's clear we need to destroy it. Time for Operation Moon Crash. To start things off, we'll need the Guru to take out the gyrocopter. With it gone, we'll have clear skies for Phase 2. Now, according to Aboriginal folklore, the Mask of Dark Earth is the sworn enemy of the Moon Spirit. So, given Murray's moon shape, we'll coat him in the glowing oil and have him pose as the Spirit. We'll then dangle him from the crane. The mask is sure to spot his ancient foe and come running. That's when we'll strike. Murray, thunder plop off the crane and obliterate that mask. With the mask destroyed and the miners run off, the guru will be free to join the team for the Cooper Vault job. Carmelita just lay there, unconscious, helpless on the desert floor. Being gentlemen, we kept watch over her throughout the night. Her camera proved to be a real source of entertainment as we took turns posing. Didn't want her to go home empty-handed. Morning broke, and we got a clear view of the landscape. It was beautiful, empty of the miners that had been digging and drilling into the sacred place. The moment was broken as Carmelita began to stir, and we prepared for another quick exit. Only this time, it wasn't just the three of us. For the first time in Cooper gang history, we picked up a new member, and the team would never be the same. Bentley was obsessed. Every night he'd pour over the blueprints to Dr. M's fortress, looking for a way to get into the Cooper vault. He soon came to the conclusion that there was no way inside unless the gang picked up a dedicated RC specialist, an expert who had mechanical and piloting skills far exceeding his own. After weeks of searching techie chat rooms, he finally found someone who could keep up with him intellectually. A gearhead genius out of Holland named Penelope. She politely declined our invitation to join the team, saying she only works for the best. Apparently, her idea of the best was her boss the Black Baron, a big-time dogfighting champ up there in Holland. He's so good that he's even set up an international competition called Aces to attract worthy opponents. A 
A few days later, she sent us a counteroffer. If our gang could manage to beat the Black Baron at his own game, then she'd know we weren't just a pack of jokers, and therefore, worth her time. So, we got busy. With no time to lose, Bentley and Murray worked to put a plane together, while I got my pilot license the fastest way possible. We'd prove to this Penelope that the Cooper gang was up for the challenge, even if we were making it all up as we went along. Okay, fellas, according to the Aces Flight lineup, we'll be flying against Team Iceland and Team Belgium in tomorrow's semi-final round. As you're all aware, we've only got a single plane, while our opponents will be flying 15 apiece. You got that, guys? That's 30 to 1 odds against us. In order to give us a fighting chance, we'll need to pit these two teams against each other. First, Murray and Sly will paddle through the sewers beneath town to get access to an air vent leading into Team Iceland's hotel room. Steal one of their trademark Viking helmets, then head over to Team Belgium's hangar. Vandalize one of their aircraft, then flap the helmet in order to frame Team Iceland for the damage. Next, Murray and I will steal one of Team Belgium's monogram handkerchiefs. Meanwhile, the Guru will break into the Team Iceland supply truck, carrying their lucky ice sculpture. Sly will steal the art and then place the handkerchief insinuating Team Belgium for the crime. Get it? We frame both teams so they'll be gunning for each other and not Sly in the semifinals. All the while, I'll be setting up defenses around the Team Cooper air hangar. You never know when one of the other teams might come looking to do us some harm. himself. We need to remove him from the competition. Here's the plan. I'll challenge him to a fist fight out in the town square. Sly, you find and lure Inspector Fox to the same place. When the two meet, the sparks are sure to fly. With some luck, the big guy will get carted off to jail and we'll have clear skies for the fight. However, the Baron won't be so easy to deal with. He commands an enormous team of flyers and has been known to bring in a squad of blimp gunships when things look grim. The answer to our problem isn't obvious, although it is potent. Behold, Lupus Gigantormus. I'll drug the beast so that the Guru will be able to ride it and take out some of the local guards, who also serve as the Baron's pilots. Obviously, the fewer enemy pilots Sly has to deal with in the finals, the better. Next, I'll hack into the aircraft control tower. If successful, I'll be able to intercept any messages the Baron might send to his gunships. Alright team, we've got all night to prepare. If we take this thing, it'll be more than a trophy. Penelope is sure to join our gang. After her stellar work defending our hangar, I'm sure we'd all agree that she's a prime recruit. Thanks to our combined efforts, we're now ready for the final round of the Aces dogfighting competition. Put on your helmets, cause it's time for Operation Turbo Dominant Eagle. 
In just a few hours, Team Iceland and Team Belgium will begin fighting it out in the B-Champs round. This will provide the perfect cover for step one of my plan. Sly, use the catapult and your paraglider to get access to the local gunships. Land some tracking devices, then head back to the Team Hangar and suit up for the finals. Murray, you're up next. Use your rowboat to pull down the aircraft communication antenna. With it out of commission, the Baron will have to use an unscrambled radio frequency to call in the gunships for backup. If that happens, I'll be ready with our secret weapon. And with the tracking devices installed, I'm guaranteed not to miss. In the end, though, it'll be up to slide. This is a sudden death competition. The first team to take out last year's champ wins. That's if the Black Baron doesn't take out all the competition first. It was quite a revelation. Penelope and the Black Baron were one and the same. But before we could even process this turn of events, we were rushed to the winner's circle. Somehow, against all odds, we become this year's champions. There was a bit of an awkward moment between Bentley and Penelope. I guess the photos they'd sent each other over the internet were a bit exaggerated. That night, Penelope explained that the disguise was invented to get her past the dogfighting league's strict age requirements. However, after winning, the Baron became a celebrity and she found herself putting on the costume more and more often. But now, with the Black Baron out of the picture, she was free to take up a new path, and she joined the gang without hesitation. The next day, our newest recruit treated us to a week-long aerial tour of Holland. She was fitting in just fine. After a careful analysis of Dr. M's fortress, Bentley came to the difficult conclusion that his demolition skills just weren't going to be enough. If we wanted to get inside the Cooper vault, we'd have to recruit a full-time demolition specialist. However, Bentley's proposed candidate was a shock, my old enemy, the Panda King. As a member of the original Fiendish Five, he had a part in taking out my dad and stealing pages from the Thievius Raccoonus. Eventually, I caught up with him, and I claimed back what he had stolen. There was no way I was gonna let that monster on my team, but Bentley was firm. He discovered the Panda King had left his life of crime and was now a monk living the life of quiet meditation high up in the mountains. I wasn't at all convinced, but there was no denying that he had the skills we needed if we were to succeed. So the gang packed up, put on our disguises, and headed east to China. The Panda King wasn't any more excited about the notion of him joining the gang than I was. If it weren't for the guru, who for some reason really hit it off with the old guy, the whole deal would have been a bust. We could see the anger in the Panda King's eyes as he recounted how he lost a member of his own family. A daughter who was abducted by a powerful general from the Northern Mountains. She was to be the bride in a forced marriage to this unscrupulous ruler, and Panda King was exiled. We agreed to help him recover his lost daughter in exchange for his skills in the Cooper Vault job. I still wasn't convinced this was a good idea, but a deal's a deal.
know that our objective here is to retrieve the Panda King's daughter, Jane King. She's being kept against her will by this man, General Sal. A real key to this guy. During surveillance, I actually witnessed him kick a puppy twice. He plans on forcing Jing King to marry him next Saturday. Clearly, time is of the essence. Here's the plan. First, I'll approach Sao in disguise and attempt to get hired as his wedding planner. Hopefully, with a man on the inside, we'll get some news on Jing King. Still, we need more information. Two of us will need to work together to steal a pair of twin keys and break into Sao's house of business. Once inside, I'll need to utilize some new technology to circumvent their ultra-tight security. Finally, thanks to Penelope's air sweeps, we've picked up an unusual radio signature out in the water. Someone will need to go eyeball the anomaly and figure out what it is. We can't leave anything up to chance here, or Jing King lives unhappily ever after. is running smoothly. With access to General Sal's database and Sly successfully hired on as the wedding photographer, we are ready to make an attempt for Jing King. Given the complexity of Sal's downloaded data, I've programmed my ThiefNet computer to automatically analyze the... What the... General Sal! He's... He's got my computer! Our whole plan is on that computer! How'd he find us? We're doomed! Bentley, calm down. I need you sharp. Listen up, team. This Sao character is more clever than any of us thought. As of this moment, we have one goal. Steal back the thief net computer. The time for subtlety is over. Bentley, break into the palace and ransack his personal computer. He might have linked it to ours. If so, that's where we'll start. The rest of the team will stand ready. No telling where this might take us. The wedding is still on. Jing King remains Sal's prisoner. Yes, we are going to free her, but that's not enough. No, for this heist, we really need to put the screws to this guy. He's earned it. So, we're cleaning out his treasury as well. A feat impossible without Murray's van. Unfortunately, all that time in the ice has ruined its polycellular battery. I'll need Sly's help to acquire a new one, which won't be easy. As the General's gone all out with security, he's even resorted to black magic dragons and hopping vampires patrolling the streets. We'll need to even the odds before the wedding. Sly, you and the Panda King will work to gather some fireworks and blow up the vampire's crypt. No crypt, no more vampires. Time to free Jing King, rob General Sal blind, and send him up the river. I call it Operation Wedding Crasher. This will be a multi-pronged job with two groups working simultaneously. I'm sure I don't need to stress the importance of the schedule to anyone. First, Sly, Penelope, and Murray will make their way past all the security in Sal's treasure temple, and then drop the goods off to me for loading into the van. Meanwhile, the Panda King and Guru will tunnel beneath the palace, creating an escape route for Jing King. Sly, you'll have to pull double duty taking care of any topside security designed to detect subterranean assaults. Once you guys are done, I'll use my grapple cam to lure Inspector Fox into the palace, where we'll try to get her to take Jing King's place. Then, with the girl and loot in hand, we run for it. General Sao had his wedding right on schedule. Everything was as he'd arranged, except the bride came as kind of a shock. Carmelita was a little disappointed it wasn't me she busted at the altar, although I doubt she minded taking Sao into custody. He did, after all, plague the streets with the undead. From what I hear, the locals were happy to see him go.
We dropped off Jean King with her aunt. The Panda King insisted that she be safe there and that he needed to pay off his debt to the gang. I was still wary, but there was no denying that his skills would come in handy. Needless to say, we lived it up in the back streets of Shanghai. What kind of gang of thieves would we be if we passed up on recreation like that? We got the message late one Saturday night. Dimitri was calling in the favor I promised him back in Holland. He gone ahead and booked the whole team passage under assumed identities to none other than Blood Bath Bay. Easily the most lawless town on earth. It's home to a group of cultural hermits who doggedly maintain the ways of their pirate forefathers. The cruise over gave us some time to get the rundown from Dimitri. I guess his grandfather, Remy Lesto, was a pioneer in deep sea diving. He'd made a fortune looting undersea wrecks. Although his luck ran short when a young cutthroat by the name of Black Spot Pete stole not only his loot, but his precious diving gear as well. A broken man, Remy retired from treasure hunting and eventually started a family. Dimitri, growing up on his grandfather's stories, dreamed of one day recovering the gear. So that was our task. We've been called in to get our hands on this miraculous diving equipment. Not all bad, really. If things go our way, the team might get a frogman out of the deal, which Bentley figures will be a big help cracking the Cooper vault. That Bentley, always thinking. to the armor and forced death's head. It'll also come in handy for our second objective, destroying the Red Sail Sea Dog Clan. They're a fleet of mercenaries on Lafui's books. We need to surprise them now while they hunt for us in small groups. If they ever attack in unison, there's no way we'd make it out alive. And finally, we'll set sail for the misty waters inhabited by a sea monster the pirates call Crusher. Reports on Crusher are sketchy, but we might learn something by analyzing its technique. I know for a fact that all of Lefui's men fear it. An impressive and useful trait, given our current situation. Operation 
reverse double cross. Our goal, as we all know, is to save Penelope. Given her crafty nature, Lefwi has undoubtedly locked her up in one of his most secure locations. They are, one, the Skull Keep, and two, the Brig of the Death's Head. Our team is too small to assault both simultaneously, so we'll have to fall back on a little slide of hand. First, we sail in and exchange broadsides with the Death's Head. Armed with the element of surprise and our cannon upgrades, it should be a fair fight. But remember, Penelope might be on board, so we cannot sink this ship. Once the masts fall, Sly should jump onto the enemy vessel and then promptly surrender. A necessary step for two reasons. First, that boat is packed with pirates, way too many to fight hand to hand. And second, it's the best way to get an audience with Lafui. Given his smug nature, he's sure to brag where she's hidden if we can get him angry enough. Got that slide? Irritate the daylights out of this guy. It's our best and only chance to rescue Penelope. Once he talks, we roll out plan A or B, depending on the situation. This Lefui is a smart man. Our only hope is to outsmart him at his own game. Lefui was beat, outsmarted by our own resident genius, who'd done more than just rescue a team member, he'd won himself a girlfriend. It was nice to hear him talk. They'd have these conversations the rest of us couldn't even follow. Far as I could tell, they were made for each other. Dimitri was in love too. The new diving gear had gone to his head. We were informed that he'd be our frogman for the Cooper vault job. Not that any of us had even asked him. For the first time in memory, Carmelita didn't show up and cart everyone to jail. Oh well, I'll send her a postcard. You know, I'd hate to have her feel left out. All these memories, they just bring me back to the same place. Getting crushed to death in the fist of some genetics experiment gone wrong. Not the way I thought I'd go out. Shame, really. Now that we've got this big gang... Gang. More like a pack of misfits. Either way, we've become a team. We had some real potential there. Could have pulled off some big jobs. We were so close. The door to the Cooper vault was opening. But that Dr. M, if there's any justice, he'll get his. I just wish I'd seen what was in there. A stockpile of my family's accomplishments. Would I have measured up? What would I contribute? Would my father have been proud of me or ashamed? Funny, but here I am at the end and suddenly all I can think about is what a coward I've been towards Carmelita. I never took the next step. Looking at Bentley and Penelope, it's clear what life is about. If Carmelita was here, I'd tell her straight out how I feel and quit playing around. Put our professional differences aside and see if we can make it work. But that'll never happen now. I can't take this crushing. Just let the pain stop. We watched as Dr. M just stood there, unwilling to leave as the walls caved in on the vault. He'd spent his life lusting over the Cooper fortune, and he wasn't going to give it up, no matter what the cost. Our exit was a little rough. 
but Murray managed to get us out just in time to witness the final fate of the Cooper legacy. It was a bittersweet moment. The end of the road always is. We both looked on, lost in our thoughts, thinking back on all the adventures that had brought us here. The people we'd met and places we'd seen. We'd worked for a long time to get Sly into that great vault, and now its secrets were hidden again, this time for good. I could only hope that he'd found what he was looking for in there. We searched every inch of the island for Sly, retrieving the gang one by one, only to make the surprising discovery that he didn't want to be found. As always, he'd left a calling card. Only this time, it was worth millions. The months rolled by, and when Sly still hadn't shown up, Murray headed back east to complete his training with the Guru. Without Sly as our leader, for the first time, we each had to step out on our own. A difficult thing. We'd been together ever since we met at the orphanage. To this day, Murray and I are still close. Recently, he's been trying to break into the pro racing circuit, stock band class. Things are looking good. He's got a unique talent for living through crashes other people would have found fatal just always bounces clear. And of course, there's Penelope, my new partner in crime. Let me tell you, I'm in love. She and I have set out on a journey that I never would have dreamed up while running with Sly and Murray, although I hope our paths will cross again soon. So while this might be the end of our adventures together, it could be the start of something even bigger. Time will tell. Literally. Cause I'm building a time machine to find out. Dimitri went on to become a celebrity skin diver. The ladies flocked to him, and so did the money. I got a postcard from him once. It said, I'm here, wish you were fine. Like me. He's his own man. The Panda King returned to China and lived a happy life living two doors down from his beloved daughter. She, of course, was pleased to have him screen all of her future suitors. As of yet, she's still unmarried. The guru returned to the outback and took on some new Dreamtime students one of which was a high-profile rock star that brought a lot of unwanted media attention. Last I heard, he was hiding out in New York City. Figured it was the last place they'd ever look. Devil. <laughs> <laughs> 